I was recording my lecture earlier today, and it cut out on me at, at like 20 or 30 seconds, and I didn't recognize it until I was like an hour and 15 minutes into it, and I'm like, crap. It seems to be working better. I don't know. Anyways. Ah, network problems. Okay, so there's an allosteric site, and the allosteric, uh, usually the allosteric component comes in, it's, it's another small molecule, it alters the shape of the enzyme. Okay. Sometimes it makes it so it binds better to the substrate. Sometimes it makes it so it binds not as good. So you can get it to go faster if it binds better. You can make it go slower if uh, it binds less well, okay. altering the shape so that the substrate doesn't fit as well. So I'll go into those details. Uh, you can also have feedback control. Anybody went in feedback is like when a stereo, like what's feedback on a microphone? What is that? You know what I'm talking about? What's that? You know when somebody's talking on a microphone and it goes, it makes that sound? That's feedback. What's happening in feedback? So you take a microphone and you stick it right, if you ever wanted to do this for fun, you take a microphone and you stick it in front of the speaker where the sound is coming out. Then a little sound comes out of the speaker, goes into the microphone. What does the microphone do? It amplifies it again, comes out of the speaker, then what happens? It gets loud, it gets louder and louder and louder, and eventually you have that horrible noise that comes out of the speaker. That's a positive feedback, right? Where something comes, produces a signal that then gets amplified and produces more signal. That's a positive feedback. We can have feedback control an enzyme that's both positive and negative. Generally, negative feedback is what? Let's say I give you some negative feedback. What does that do to you? You adjust your initial whatever. Yeah, whatever you're doing, you adjust it to try to not have it as much negative feedback. Negative feedback is often used when a product is produced and you get enough of the product, that product comes back and inhibits the enzyme so not as much of that material gets made anymore. So it suppresses the production of something by having negative feedback. Uh, covalent modification is really what we were talking about in that first slide, phosphorylation or dephosphorylation. dephosphorylation uh, and it's also in an enzyme. Let's say you have an enzyme for digestion. Let's say it's produced in your liver. But are you digesting stuff in your liver? No, it's in your stomach, right? So you have to transport that enzyme for digestion to your stomach, right, where it's going to be used. And sometimes these we, we call proenzyme or, oh, there's another name for it. I'll come up with it later. But the, these pre-enzymes need to be modified so they're actually active. And so a lot of times they're modified at the site where they're used. And so we can have covalent modification. Insulin is one of those enzymes as well. We'll show that. Okay. So... Positive allosteric. Remember, we talked. I just mentioned allosteric. This is what the enzyme looks like. This is the active site. This is the small molecule that fits into the active site. When it binds, it changes the shape of the active site so that the substrate fits better, and that causes the reaction to go faster. Okay. We can also have negative allosteric interactions where the Small molecule comes in and binds to the enzyme, changes the shape so that the substrate doesn't fit as well, and so then the reaction goes slower, okay? So allosteric interaction essentially is a site not associated with, it's not on the active site, but regulates the enzyme activity by changing the shape of the whole enzyme. So feedback control, okay. So typically in feedback control, what it says here, the end product of a series of reactions, doesn't have to be a series of reactions, but it could be just one. But the end product, okay, produced is a negative regulator and binds to the allosteric site. So think how that might work, okay, because I don't like their picture, so I'm going to draw my picture. Here's my little enzyme, and he's producing substrate.
here's the reactant coming in. Okay, so they're going through this line. My enzyme is making squares, right, out of circles. Very fancy enzyme. If I wanted to have negative feedback control, right, then what I would do is I would put an allosteric site on my enzyme where this guy could come and bind, okay? And when it binds, it changes the shape in such a way that this slows the rate of the reaction. Okay, so that's what they mean. You produce a, in a negative feedback, all right, you produce a regulator from one of the products. It could be down the stream. It could be like two or three enzymes down the stream. Produce a product that goes back to the initial enzyme or one of the early enzymes and shuts it off. Okay. Could be. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that keeps the substrate from binding and then slows down the reaction. Um, the other thing that happens, though, let's go back to my little silly drawing. Let's say this is controlled in such a way that you're getting the right amount of material. If this stuff gets used up, then what happens? As it gets used up, the allosteric control is no longer there and more product gets produced. So it can both work in both directions, both but it regulates the rate at which product is produced by the Uh, they showed it with this whole series of things, okay? So this is the same thing. Substrate produces a product uh, through a bunch of enzymes. You get a negative regulator. Negative regulator comes back here. What does it do when it binds here? Stops the reaction, okay? So I like my simple picture better. Um, let's see. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, forgot. There's the word I forgot. Zymogens are proenzymes. So zymogens are enzymes that are produced and then covalently modified uh, so that they can be used or so that they're active. And it turns out the covalent modification a lot of times is, re is reversible. Okay. So I give you an example of of what this looks like. Um, let's say this is the primary sequence of a peptide. And this is the active enzyme, okay? What the, actually happens in the enzyme, in order to make the active enzyme, it actually cleaves out sections of the peptide. It recognizes specific sequences, cuts those things out, and then what's left is the active enzyme. So this part is the zymogen or the proenzyme, and this is the active. What we think of, when we think about enzymes, we think about things that catalyze reactions. This is the thing that catalyzes the reaction. And that's done by removing these sequences, these sequences of peptides from the main parent sequence, okay? So just to give you an idea, uh, this is an example of uh, trypsin. And uh, that's what I called it anyways. And chymotrypsin or chymotrypsinogen and trypsinogen. Uh, these are the digestive enzymes that help to break down amino acids, right? Stored in the pancreas until you eat food and then they're released uh, when uh, it's triggered by hormones from the pancreas that cause those segments to be cut out and then you digest your food. Okay? So it controls when the food is digested uh, by cleaving those sections out. And that's triggered by your body when you eat food. Another interesting one is insulin. Okay? So this is uh, the pro-insulin or the zymogen. This is the active insulin. And actually what it does is it takes segments out of here and here and cuts it to produce the active insulin molecule, okay? So your body can make up enzymes, store them away, and then when it needs it, it can activate them, which is, if you think about it, it's like, yeah, that makes sense, right? Rather than trying to make them all when you need them, it's just to store some up, okay? Yeah, this was phosphorylation. I don't know how I got that slide in the beginning, too, but anyways, I just talked about it then. 
This is another, uh, again, covalent modification is, is, again, phosphorylation or dephosphorylation. So let's do a study check. Indicate whether the following statements describe enzyme regulation by allosteric enzyme, zymogen, or covalent modification. So an end product attaches to the regulatory site of the first enzyme in the reaction sequence. Allosteric, because it's a product that's produced, so it's a feedback control. Proinsulin forms in the pancreas. Zymogen, that's a pre-enzyme or pro-enzyme. And then phosphorylation, phosphor, uh, phosphorylase kinase deactivates py pyruvate. That's the covalent modification, right? Phosphorylation is a covalent modification. Yay. Well, that's that section. If I start sweating up here, it's only because it's really hot. It feels even hotter here. Yeah, What's that? Did they start putting the heaters on? Apparently. So there's different kinds of inhibitors. Let's talk about those really quick. Um, the slides seem to be mixed up, but I think it's okay. So um, let me ask you first. When I say you're a, let's say, uh, let's say you're. Mm, You play a basketball game. Uh, we call that a competition, right? And how many people, how many teams win a basketball game? One, One right? So let's say we apply the analogy to an enzyme. There are enzyme inhibitors that are known to be competitive. You have the same common goal of winning the game, right? When you're in competition with each other, you act at the same, you're both playing on the same court, right? That's a competitive situation where you're competing with each other. Now, if you're playing a football game, okay? So, sorry, so that's a, com that's a competitive inhibitor. Your opponent is your competitive inhibitor. You're trying to win, you're playing on the same court, okay? Um, and your competition controls how fast you score points, right? So now we're going to go into what's called a non-competitive inhibitor. So non, so you're going to like my analogy. I just thought of this. So a non-competitive inhibitor, okay, doesn't act at the active site. For example, football game, and you deflate the footballs. <laughs> That's a form of non-competitive inhibition because what did you do? You didn't actually affect the game and the players. You took the ball and you made it not as you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Right? There's that whole Tom Brady incident. He rigged the game, potentially. I don't know that he did. I'm not saying he did, but I just think it's a good example. He rigged the game by making it not fair by having a different size ball. That's like altering the shape of the enzyme, but not directly at the active site. Okay? So that's a non-competitive inhibitor. So the structure of a non-competitor does, inhibitor doesn't resemble the substrate, and does not compete for the active sites, okay? What it does instead is it binds to a different part of the enzyme and changes the shape to slow down or speed up the reaction, okay? Honestly, couldn't they tell the balls weren't inflated? I don't know. Haven't they played football like their whole life? You would think that somebody would say, hey, that ball's not inflated, but okay. So there's an active site. Oops. Oh, I lost, con lost control of this thing. That's working. My pointer disappeared, though. Oh, I know. There we go. There's an active site. A substrate would normally go in, produce a product. And then you put a non-competitive inhibitor. Doesn't look like the substrate binds over here and then s slows down the reaction, OK?
Um, let's see if I have another slide in here. Hang on. So competitive inhibitors, right, looks like the substrate and just competes by binding with the active site. So that's like a fair game, right? Both guys trying to play for the same active site, right? You could have really strong inhibitors which bind to the active site more strongly than the substrate, or you could have very weak inhibitors that bind less strongly than the, the, to the active site than the substrate does, okay? So it literally wins the game by out-competing the substrate for the enzyme pocket, and then doesn't allow, then this, once you block it, the substrate can't come in and form, finish the reaction, okay? Yeah, so allosteric enzymes are, would fall into that category of allosteric interaction because, and, and non-competitive because they're coming in from a different site and altering the substrate pocket. Yeah. And, but a competitive inhibitor doesn't have to be an allosteric enzyme. It just goes straight in and blocks it. Right. Let's see here. I didn't want to talk about all of this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pew, 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 pew. Okay, so um, there are different kinds of uh, inhibition. In addition to having competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, you can have both reversible and irreversible. Okay, so an irreversible inhibitor. What does that sound like? It does changes it irreversibly, often through a covalent bond, changes the structure of the enzyme. And then things that are reversible tend to be like the substrate or in the allosteric site and don't actually modify the enzyme. So they can leave freely and go in and out, okay? Um, let's see. So in, uh, irreversible inhibitors, right, can actually modify, for example, R groups of amino acids, change the shape of the enzyme, and prevent the substrate from actually getting to the active site. Um, my understanding is that's the way aspirin works. And when it uh, affects uh, cyclooxygenase, it modifies the serine residue and bonds, specifically bonds to the, the OH group on the serine in the active site and prevents further uh, catalysis of the substrate molecule, which is arachidonic acid. Um, so they gave some, uh, a bunch of examples. I'm not going to go through all of these. Where is it, though? Oh, yeah. Cyanide, right? That's kind of a fun one. Uh, source, bitter almonds. I don't know. They tell me that it tastes like almonds. If you're working, I worked with cyanide a lot, and you know that you did something wrong when you can taste the almonds. Because you're not actually, like, touching it, but you're making compounds out of it, and then you know that you, you, when you taste the almond, you, it's like dissolved in your mouth from the air because it makes HCN gas. That's the stuff they use in the gas chamber. So you know that it, you've done something wrong when you can actually taste it. Um, it bonds to the heme group, right? Cytochrome C, an enzyme in electron transport. And it basically puts a short circuit in your electron transport chain so that you just constantly use energy, but you don't get anything from it. You don't get any ATP from it. Okay, let's see. I'm going to skip over this. Okay, let's see if we can do this. Oh, yeah, I didn't talk about this. So let's talk about A. Uh, if you have a competitive inhibitor and you increase the substrate concentration, what do you think that's going to do? It's going to compete better, right? So it can outcompete the inhibitor. So this first one says increases increased substrate reverses inhibition. That means the substrate now can push out 
um, the inhibitor and sort of, um, I don't want to say it, reactivate the enzyme. Okay? I don't think I have the enzyme. So, so this first one is, a, is something that you would see with a competitive inhibitor because it has this, the inhibitor and the substrate have the same shape. They're competing for the same site. So it binds to the enzyme surface, but not the active site. That's a non-competitive inhibitor. Its structure is similar to the substrate. Competitive. Right. Inhibition is not reversed by adding more substrate. Non-competitive. Because the substrate and the, and the inhibitor don't have the same shape. They're competing with for this. The inhibitor goes to the allosteric site, just shuts the enzyme down. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Are the types of questions you're going to be asking them? Just lots of memorization kind of questions. A lot of it's from Bio 1 or Bio 11A. Is that what it's from? So you guys could tell me. I've been taking a biology class in like 30 years. So. You've never seen any of this stuff? Oh, you do? Oh. I learned it in my bio classes. Um, I just don't remember which bio classes because it was 30 years ago. <laughs> okay. Um, Enzyme cofactors and vitamins. So, uh, cofactors are uh, vitamins are just organic cofactors. Okay, that's just a pretty picture. Sorry, I'm gonna skip over that. So, a simple enzyme is an active enzyme that has on, only uh, that consists only of proteins. But a lot of enzymes need what they call a helper molecule. And these are known as cofactors. They're, if they're organic, uh, we call them vitamins. Organic mean carbon, hydrogen, you know, of an organic nature. Those are what we call vitamins. So these cofactors are not vitamins. They're minerals, actually. Um, get my pointer to point. So copper, iron, zinc, magnesium, manganese, nickel, and these are some of the enzymes that you find these cofactors in. These are inorganic uh, cofactors. Um, and we find that a lot of times we need metal ions as cofactors because it helps to bond, because of the ions, helps the substrate to bond to the active site. Okay. So carboxypeptidase, it bonds to the C terminal of an aromatic amino acid. But you can imagine that in order to bond to the C terminal of, the, uh, of an amino acid or bond to amino acid in general, you need to have some charge. And that's what the charge provides, a, a way to pull the substrate in. Okay. So vitamins organic, um, we have two kinds of vitamins, or we classify them. Uh, there's two kinds that we classify them as. There's the water-soluble vitamins, and then there is the fat-soluble vitamins. The water-soluble vitamins, my mom always tells me things like, oh, I can take as much of that as I want because I'll just pee it out because it's water-soluble, right? You just drink water, and it's out of your system. But that also means you need to have a constant source of these vitamins. And then there's the fat-soluble vitamins that you have to be a little bit more careful with because they store in the fat of your body, okay? So you only usually need small amounts of these things to be useful. Ascorbic acid, there's one right there. That's a cool molecule. I spent a lot of time studying that. Okay, so water-soluble vitamins come from the food each day. Because they're water-soluble, you lose them very quickly. So you, or you take a supplement. I think it's better that you just eat fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Potatoes. What's that? Potatoes. 
Or, well, no, potatoes don't really qualify. <laughs> you can eat potatoes. I just do that for potassium. Um, yeah, so you get rid of them every day. Uh, they're also very sensitive to heat and so when you cook, for example, like raw vegetables tend to have, raw foods tend to have more vitamins in them. Uh, it's probably better that you don't overcook things or heat them for too long. Yeah, and some of the vitamins are precursors to cofactors that are needed by your body. And we'll talk about some of those things. So you can think of it kind of like this, a coenzyme. That's, uh, again, another name for a type of cofactor. Okay, uh, Prepares the active site so that the substrate binds more readily. Uh, but it... A lot, sometimes that cofactor is recycled and reused over and over again, and sometimes it gets used and has to be replenished, okay? Uh, these lists are far too long. I'm going to leave the slides with you to look at them because I'm not going to go over them one by one. But this table is in your book, but it gives you a list of the different vitamins. Uh, I am not going to ask you um, what the RDA is. That's a recommended daily allowance for that vitamin. Um, but uh, it would be good to know these names. I don't think you need to know all their specific functions. That's not the kind of class that this is. Okay? But know that we have vitamins. Uh, they go through this list one at a time in the slides. So B1, B2, B3. I'm not going to go through all these. I just want you to know it's there. You should go over these and be generally familiar with what they do. Okay. Yeah, which one do you want to see? The table. So it doesn't matter which one am I on. Uh, it is table 2010 in the latest edition of the book, yeah. It's far too much information. I think you're better off just reading it yourself, basically. And then I can get on to the next uh, chapter. And I'll... Uh, I'll, this slide has the answers to it, so you can just quiz yourself later, okay? Okay.